This is Duke University. So ladies and gentlemen, our, our distinguished guests, Dean Levy, my name is Jonathan Nussbaum. I'm the president of the Moot Court Board. In a moment, you're going to hear more about this competition, the problem, the participants, and the judges. But first, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the Dean's Cup Finals this evening. Uh, for 50 years, the Dean's Cup has been Duke's preeminent oral advocacy competition. And that tradition continues tonight. It's an enriching educational experience uh, made possible only by the contributions of many, many people. Uh, and I look out, I see many of them in the audience tonight. I see professors who helped uh, moot our teams early in the competition. I see competitors from earlier rounds and friends who helped uh, as the competitors were practicing and up late at night researching. Uh, taking a note from the Oscars last night, I'll refrain from thanking everybody who deserves praise. You can look at the first page of the program to see all that. But I would be remiss if I did not thank Dean Levy for making this tournament such a priority. Uh, the support from his office uh, has permeated throughout the law school and has made a lot of this possible. Uh, in a moment, I'll, I'll turn this over to the four people who are really uh, most responsible for, for putting this competition together. But first, I'd like to ask if you could turn off all cell phones, uh, close any laptops or any other electronic device that might interrupt tonight. Uh, but with that out of the way, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our intramural chair, Ms. Corey Blylevin, who will talk to you about the history and the uh, makeup of the Dean's Cup uh, competition. Thank you. The Dean's Cup competition was founded in 1963 by Deans E.R. Laddie and J.D. Johnston. It is Duke's premier oral advocacy competition. The Dean's Cup is held annually for second and third year law students and is organized by the Moot Court Board. It is the primary way for second and third year students to gain membership on the board. The Dean's Cup has three phases. In the first round, students compete individually in front of faculty and alumni. 16 students advance. They are placed in teams by power matching, assigned a side, and submit a brief. After a round robin, the top team from each side advances to the final round. The winners of today's final round will be presented with the Dean's Cup trophy, and the judges have sole discretion to announce both the winning team and the best oralist. Emily Spiegel will introduce our panel. We are honored to be hosting a panel of three distinguished judges for tonight's final round. Our presiding judge this evening is Judge Marjorie Rendell. Judge Rendell was nominated to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit by President Clinton and has served there since 1997. She was previously a district court judge for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and was also a partner at Duane Morrison Heckscher in Philadelphia. Judge Rendell received her JD from Villanova University. We're also joined by Judge Andre Davis. Judge Davis was nominated to the Fourth Circuit by President Obama in 2009. Prior to his appointment, he served as a district court judge for the District of Maryland. In addition to work in private practice, he has served in the Department of Justice as a judge in Maryland state courts and as a professor at the University of Maryland School of Law, where he also earned his JD. And rounding out our panel tonight is Judge Catherine Eagles. Judge Eagles was nominated to the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of North Carolina by President Obama and has served there since 2010. She previously served as the senior resident judge for the Superior Court of Guilford County, North Carolina. She was also a partner at Smithmore Leatherwood in Greensboro, and Judge Eagles received her JD from the George Washington University School of Law. And Neil Wally will now introduce our four finalists. Representing the petitioners are two L. Shafali Baliga and Nina Gupta. Shafali is originally from Georgia and graduated from Emory University. At Duke, she's an, inter she's an interscholastic coordinator for the Moot Court Executive Board and was recently elected executive editor of the Duke Law Journal. She will be spending the summer with Williams and Connolly in Washington, D.C. and King and Spaulding in Atlanta, Georgia. Nina is originally from North Carolina and is a UNC graduate. She's a staff editor for Law and Contemporary Problems and a member of the Moot Court Board. This summer, she will be a summer associate at Paul Hastings in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> 
Representing the respondents are Castile Sugar and Oscar Shine. Castile is a 2L from Ohio and graduated from The Ohio State University. At Duke, she's a member of both the moot court and mock trial boards and is a member of the Duke Forum for Law and Social Change. She will be spending the summer with Jones Day in Columbus, Ohio. Oscar Schein is a 3L from California. After graduating from Berkeley, he worked at Google. At Duke, Oscar is a member of the moot court board and an executive editor of the Duke Law Journal. After graduating, he will spend the summer with Sullivan and Cromwell in New York City and then clerk for 11th Circuit Judge Gerald B. Joflat. And now Haley Warden Rogers will give a brief overview of the Dean's Cup competition problem. This year's Dean's Cup competition problem is based on a case called Johnson v. Bredesen. Petitioners, represented by Shafali Baliga and Nina Gupta, raise an as-applied constitutional challenge to Tennessee's felon reenfranchisement statute. The statute offers a path to restore the right to vote to felons who've completed the terms of their custodial sentence, but requires payment of any restitution or child support obligations as a condition of reenfranchisement. Here, petitioners are convicted felons who have been constitutionally disenfranchised under Tennessee law and have completed their prison sentences and satisfied the terms of their parole. They desire the restoration of their voting rights, but are completely unable to pay their child support and restitution obligations. They challenge the reenfranchisement scheme under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, as well as the 24th Amendment, which guarantees that the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged by failure to pay any poll tax or other tax. Petitioner's claim was dismissed on the pleadings, and the decision was affirmed by the Sixth Circuit. They now appeal their claim to the Supreme Court of the United States. All rise. Oye, oye, oye. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and the Honorable Supreme Court. Chief Justice Rendell, and may it please the court, my name is Shafali Baliga, and I, along with my co-counsel Nina Gupta, are counsel for the petitioners, Jim Harris, Terrence Johnson, and Joshua Roberts. I'll be addressing why the lower court erred in its analysis of the Equal Protection Clause, and Ms. Gupta will be arguing why the lower court erred in its analysis of the 24th Amendment. With the court's permission, we reserve two minutes for rebuttal. That's granted. This case is about preventing a state from continuing to disenfranchise petitioners simply because they are too poor to pay for reenfranchisement. The petitioners have made good faith and reasonable efforts to pay back their child support and restitution payments. They have com completed their imprisonment, parole, and probation periods. Uh, Counselor, I don't see poverty referred to at all in the uh, 2006 amendment. Can you explain why you're, you're talking about indigence and, and poverty? That, that really doesn't appear in the, in the amendment, does it? Your Honor, that's correct that the statute doesn't directly target indigent petitioners. However, in operation, it works to disadvantage them because only those who don't have the means to pay back their child support and restitution payments can't regain the right to vote. While is, that, is that clear? I mean, if someone decides they're just not going to pay restitution or they're just not going to pay child support, but they have the money, um, they would be covered also, wouldn't they? Your Honor, under this statute or under this challenge, we, we challenge it as an as-applied to the petitioners. And in the record, they are, they are indigent right, under the statute. From your complaint. All right, is, is there actually such a thing as an as-applied equal protection challenge? Yes, Your Honor. In this case, we aren't arguing that, for example, if our client were Martha Stewart, that we would challenge this statute. Rather, again, we only challenge it because in this case, the state has erected a financial barrier, one that is practically impossible for the petitioners to accomplish. And but, but isn't the, the, the gravamen of, of an equal protection claim is class-based, and the distinction is between groups? 
And so it's not like the First Amendment, arguably. Um, what are the elements of an as-applied equal protection challenge? Your Honor, in this case... Does, if, if you were to succeed here, does that mean that the state would have to contend with litigation by every uh, a reformed felon who would come in and challenge whether he or she could or could not actually make the payments? So we'd be opening the floodgates, wouldn't we, if, if you were to succeed here? No, Your Honor, because we only challenge the statute as applied to indigent petitioners, not simply those who may also be less wealthy than other people. This case has, or excuse me, this court has traditionally scrutinized statutes that involve wealth-based classifications and adversely affect indigents to, um, to some sort of heightened form of scrutiny. Indeed, our argument is threefold. The first is that because petitioners have a fundamental right to vote, this court should subject the statute to strict scrutiny. I don't understand your concept of fundamental right to vote. You're your brief repeatedly says that it's acknowledged that felons do not have a fundamental right because uh, under, the second, under the second clause of the 14th Amendment and the Tennessee law, they've been disenfranchised. But then you say once the state opens the door somewhat to giving some the right again, somehow there's a fundamental right. What, I, what support do you have for that proposition? Your Honor, this court has never held that felons have no fundamental right to vote. Indeed, Richardson versus Ramirez simply held that a state may constitutionally disenfranchise convicted felons. And that's what's happened here, correct? That's right, but it never addressed the process of reenfranchisement, nor what constitutional protections attach once the state creates a reenfranchisement scheme, as Tennessee has done in this case. Well, what's your best case to support the proposition that once they re-enfranchise, there's a fundamental right that somehow is like a springing use or something. In Bush v. Gore, this court stated that there is no federal constitutional right to vote unless and until the state chooses a statewide election as its means for appointing its electors under Article II of the Constitution. Bush v. Gore had nothing to do with the type of statute we have here, did it? You're right, Your Honor, that that case was different than this case and the facts were quite different. However, the language that I quote from was merely the introductory kind of paragraph to the landscape of voting rights in this country. So it was dicta? It was dicta, that's right, Your Honor. Additionally, even if this court were to find that petitioners have no fundamental right to vote, petitioners can still prevail. In a line of cases involving indigents, this court has closely scrutinized those statutes and applied some form of heightened scrutiny. And the seminal case here is Griffin versus Illinois. In that case, the court acknowledged that a state never has to grant appellate review, but once it does so, it can't then discriminate on the basis of one's ability to pay in terms of actually accessing that right. I'm sorry, what case did you say? That's Griffin versus Illinois, Griffin. Your Honor. And indeed here, similarly, <clears throat> one, though the state never has to create a reenfranchisement scheme, and we acknowledge that, once the state actually does so, it can't then discriminate on the basis of one's ability to pay in terms of accessing that scheme. But doesn't that line of cases, um, does that really come into play here? Uh, we're really talking about um, a, a, the state deciding to, um, uh, you know, put certain conditions that in, in which it has a legitimate interest. And isn't that, isn't that permissible? It has an interest in making sure that restitution is paid. I mean, that's part of everyone's sentence. It has an interest in making sure that child support is paid. Um, why can't a state say these things matter and we're going to impose this requirement? Your Honor, that's correct that the state may have legitimate interests. However, the means are not closely connected to actually advancing that interest. Again, we argue that either strict scrutiny or heightened scrutiny is applicable here. And the primary reason is because the presumption underlying rational basis review is simply absent here. So you're saying that if this were, if somehow the... Uh, the felons who continue to be disenfranchised were guilty of political corruption or something like that, that, that that's a requirement here, 
that it has to be related to the crime of conviction? Is that your argument? Well, in terms of rational basis review, the child support payments are wholly unrelated to the underlying conviction. You're right that the restitution payments are more closely connected. However, under even rational basis review, the statute fails because, as the record states, the petitioners are indigent and they are unable to be incentivized to pay these payments after making good faith and reasonable efforts to do so. And that's why it's quite simply irrational to attempt to get blood from a stone. But we don't know that. We don't know that they're not going to then, I mean, they're, obviously they're indigent, they've been in jail, now they're not. Maybe they'll earn the money and pay it. This was decided on the pleadings. Should, should we have a record here? Should, should we send this back so that there can be a record developed as to whether this is burdensome and as to whether the state really has a legitimate interest? Indeed, Your Honor, we do argue that the procedural posture is important in this case and that it should be reversed and remanded for additional findings of fact, for example, of any possible animus towards certain groups or what types of discriminatory impact it may have on certain communities. But we also believe that we can prevail on the merits here. Rational basis review is not appropriate in this case because the presumption undergirding rational basis review is absent. And as respondents acknowledge in their brief, this may very well be an unwise legislative judgment. Again, because it infringes upon a voting interest, whether you accept that it's fundamental or not, but doesn't actually deliver any money to either the children of the, of the petitioners or to the victims of their crimes. You want us to decide the wisdom of a legislative enactment? Your Honor, in this case, we believe it's more appropriate to do so because petitioners don't have access to either the ballot box or the buck to make those changes themselves. That is to say that the self-correcting nature of the judicial, of the legislative process is not available to petitioners. This statute wholly prevents them from voting and thus effectuating any sort of legislative change in that way. And because they're indigent, they can't can't, they can't contribute to campaigns, and they can't contribute to political action committees and have their voice heard in that sense. And thus, this statute essentially dampens the very political processes that this court has relied upon to change unwise legislative judgments and to protect the minority against the incursion of a majority. You, you suggested to the Chief Justice that not only should we reverse here, but I thought you were suggesting that we should render judgment in your behalf, is that right, on the pleadings? Yes, Your Honor, we... How could we do that? How, how indigent is indigent? Your Honor, the petitioners have been rendered indigent, presumably by the you see, mechanism... That's, that's the problem, presumably. Are we in a position to presume a level of indigence sufficient to undermine the state's interest here? Wouldn't, Your... we, wouldn't we need fact-finding, at a minimum, fact-finding? At a minimum, we argue that remanding for additional findings of fact would be appropriate here. But again, the record does state that they're indigent, again, presumably by the standards of what Tennessee would consider a person to be indigent, presumably, again, below the poverty line. And this state of Tennessee already has mechanisms uh, to determine who actually is indigent for purposes of determining who gets court-appointed counsel. I noticed that the statute... Um Separate section talks about pardons. That's one means of re-enfranchising. Could the governor, who I presume is the authority that could grant a pardon, could the governor impose a child support uh, payment condition to a pardon? Would your argument be any different in that case? Your Honor, likely not if it still involved a challenge by indigent petitioners because they're simply unable to make these payments. And thus, any, under any level of scrutiny, the state's interests aren't actually advanced, or in your hypothetical, the governor's interests aren't actually advanced by making people who can't pay attempt to pay. Isn't your real problem here, as Sandra Day O'Connor noted in the Harvey case, that you know, you're being denied the right to vote not because you're indigent, but because the, a felony was committed. And once you've, once you've committed that felony, uh, you know, you're lucky, some people are lucky that the state is saying, okay, well, we'll, we'll let some people back in the lodge, but once you've committed the felony, um, you know, indigent or not, you've disenfranchised yourself. That's right, Your Honor, but the state of Tennessee has essentially severed the notion that the felony conviction is a bar to regaining the right to vote. Indeed, we have two classes of people here. 
Both classes of people have committed felonies, but the only thing that distinguishes one from getting the right to vote from another is a complete inability to pay for these payments. So again, the felony convictions are no longer a bar to regaining the right to vote. And again, the petitioners have completed their imprisonment parole and probation periods. They are, for all purposes, rehabilitated under the statute. Well, again, there's no finding to that effect, is there? No, there's not to, but they have completed their imprisonment, parole, and probation periods. But they haven't completed the sentence insofar as there's outstanding restitution, correct? One petitioner does have outstanding restitution. However, the court, this court in Bearden versus Georgia addressed that very issue when it noted that there's a distinction between those who willfully refuse to pay and have the means to pay and those who don't pay because they're completely unable to pay after making good faith efforts to do so. And with the latter group of people, they have shown by making good faith and reasonable efforts to pay that they are rehabilitated and they've shown a willingness to conform their conduct to the norms of society. So we don't have to worry that they're not rehabilitated anymore. Indeed, the respondent's characterization in their brief is that if something doesn't fit neatly within the fundamental right category or the suspect class category, then it's automatically subject to rational basis review. And that characterization is inaccurate, and it doesn't take into account this court's nuanced precedent in Moreno, Claiborne, Romer, Griffin and its progeny. All those cases before Justice Scalia took the court. That's right, Your Honor. In a different direction. Perhaps, Your Honor, but the, the principles still apply. Indeed, in Bearden versus Georgia, Justice O'Connor, writing for the majority, noted that the case couldn't be resolved by resorting to pigeonholing the case into equal protection framework. And as Plyler v. Doe also stated, the question is not merely whether there's a fundamental right and a suspect class. This court can take into account other considerations. And one such consideration to take into account is the nature of the interest affected here. And that's voting. And voting- Don't all the circuit courts agree that in these reenfranchisement cases, rational basis applies? Is that right? They have, Your Honor. However, this court has never stated that. And even the dissent. The dissent, yes, Your Honor, and Judge Moore, I believe, did believe that a uh, rational basis review was appropriate here. But none of those cases discuss the extent of the interest affected. Indeed, the nature of the interest affected informs the level of scrutiny that we should apply here. Are you conceding that you lose if rational basis applies? No, Your Honor, we don't. Again, because it's irrational to attempt to get blood from a stone. These people have attempted to make good faith and reasonable efforts to pay, and they simply are unable to do so. To go back to the nature of the interest here, voting is simply not on par with mere economic and tax regulation that this court routinely subjects to rational basis review. And even if this court is not willing to accept that petitioners have a fundamental right to vote, they still have an incredibly important interest in regaining their voting rights. Nearly 20% of the amendments to the U.S. Constitution, Your Honor, I see that my time is up. May I briefly conclude? Yes, please. Nearly 20% of the amendments to the U.S. Constitution involve voting and expand and extend access to new groups of voters. Petitioners are a hair's breadth away from regaining the right to vote. Because this statute cannot withstand strict scrutiny, any form of heightened scrutiny, and even rational basis review, it violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, and this court is urged to reverse the decision of the lower court. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Nina Gupta, counsel for the petitioners. Terrence Johnson, Jim Harris, and Joshua Roberts. This case is about preventing the state of Tennessee from erecting a financial barrier on the right to vote. The Tennessee statute before the court today violates the 24th Amendment of the United States Constitution for two main reasons. First, the 24th Amendment applies to the petitioners in this case because they have a right to vote within the meaning of the amendment. And second, the payments required by the statute constitute an other tax that abridge the right to vote, and they act equivalently to the prohibited poll tax by placing a mandatory financial prerequisite on the franchise. Therefore, we respectfully request that this court reverse the lower court's decision. So you just used the term financial barrier, and I noticed in your brief you tended to equate financial barrier with tax. 
Is that really the same thing? No, Your Honor. Certainly there is a distinction there. And a tax, uh, as has been defined by this court, is an enforced contribution for the support of the government. And here, these payments do constitute a tax because they are enforced by the state of Tennessee and they directly support the government of Tennessee. How do they support the government? Here we're talking about restitution that are made to third parties who have been harmed by the crime, uh, and child support, which goes to children. Um, you know, your own definition uh, really doesn't fit here, does it? Well, Your Honor, in, to begin with restitution, there are several Tennessee statutes in which an individual who owes restitution pays restitution directly to the state or federal government. Yeah, but you can't define something by virtue of the fact that there are some little payments that get made to the state. We're really trying to figure out, is this a tax? Um, so how can you really say that this is for the public support when we have restitution, the majority, when you concede that the vast majority of restitution payments are paid to, to third parties, not to the government? The majority may, Your Honor, but in certain victimless crimes, almost all of the restitution goes to either the state or federal government, particularly in Tennessee. And to go to the child support payments, in Tennessee, off of every child support payment, 5% is taken to go directly to the support of the government. So that anytime someone is ordered to pay something, and usually it's paid to third parties, but sometimes it can be paid to the government, it's a tax? Well, here, Your Honor, a substantial portion could go directly to the government. If an individual owes a great deal of child support, that 5% could potentially go to the county trustee as a part of the county revenue pursuant to Tennessee's statutory scheme. And if not, it goes to the clerk's salary, which is also directly sp supporting the government of Tennessee. That would be a surprise to all the uh, legislators who have made no, no tax increase uh, pledges <laughs> that, that now taxes <laughs> has a very, very large a huge connotation, does it not? Your Honor, I hear your concern, and certainly we don't normally consider child support payments and restitution payments as taxes. Exactly. But so how should we go out and open the floodgates in that area um, for the sake of this, this case? Well, Your Honor, this court has recently taken a functional approach to determining whether a payment is a tax. Indeed, in the recent health care decision, this court determined that although Congress had labeled the individual mandate as a penalty, it effectively operated as a tax for constitutional purposes. This court <coughs> stated that it follows a functional approach, disregarding the designation of the exaction and viewing its substance in application. And here, if we disregard the designation of the clerk's fee and look at its substance in application, it is effectively operating as a tax. This court recognized several factors to determine whether a payment is a tax. And the first one is whether it imposes an economic impediment to the activity taxed. And here it is plainly doing so. If individuals were able to make these payments, they would be able to vote in the next election. And indeed, the most important factor of a tax is whether it is raising at least some revenue for the government. So the entire portion doesn't need to go to the revenue of the government. It is only at least some. And here, we're seeing that a 5% tax off of every single child support payment is either going to the clerk's salary or going to the county trustee as a part of the county revenue. And any surplus over the clerk's salary goes directly to the county revenue. Ms. Gupta, I think I'd like to take you back to your first sub-issue. You say your clients have a right to vote. That's not my understanding of the record. They have no right to vote, in fact under the law of Tennessee. What is your argument for your rather bold statement that they in fact have a right to vote? Well, Your Honor, we argue that they have a right to vote because although they were disenfranchised pursuant to Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, that exception cannot outweigh the 24th Amendment's larger policy of equal access to the franchise. And here, the fact is, is that Tennessee has provided a means to restore the right to vote to convicted felons. And once they do so, that triggers the 24th Amendment's protections. But your clients haven't had their rights restored. No, Your Honor, they haven't, but it's because so they, they... don't have a right to vote well, as you're... we sit and stand here. Well, Your Honor, they have been unable to fulfill the conditions of the statute. So the right hasn't technically vested yet. However, by even providing an opportunity for petitioners to regain the right to vote, that then triggers the protections of the 24th Amendment. If we were to adopt the respondents' theory of the 24th Amendment as laid out in their brief, 
that would effectively allow states to erect explicit poll taxes on ex-felon citizens because we would assume that they no longer have a right to vote within the 24th Amendment, even if a state has provided a means for their reenfranchisement. It's simply- Well, the 24th Amendment says poll tax, so we know they can't do that. Yes, Your Honor. But what's happening here is because of indigent status, they are indeed prevented from, from voting, but it is not a tax on voting, is it? Well, Your Honor, it is a tax for the reasons that I mentioned, because portions of the child support and restitution payments are going directly to the state. But the more important thing here is the fact that they are directly tied to voting. Tennessee has placed these payments directly in the voting context, and it is done by design of the statute, not by effect of the statute. And if the petitioners were able to make these payments, they would be able to vote. But the point of the, of the amendment is not really related to voting, is it? The, the relationship and the interest of the state here is in getting these payments made and imposing that as a condition, but it really isn't um, that related to you know, who should have the right to vote, it's incentivizing these payments. And isn't, isn't that legitimate? And that's very different from the concept of taxation. Well, certainly, Your Honor, the state has a legitimate interest in collecting child support and restitution obligations, and they are free to do so in other ways. However, the problem here is that they have tied those payments into voting. And petitioners cannot vote until they make those payments. And that's what's problematic from the 24th Amendment perspective, is that these payments function as a tax, and they abridge the right to vote for the petitioners in this case. So are you saying it's just like if you didn't have a felony conviction, but you were behind in your child support, and the legislature said you can't vote till you bring your child support current? Are you saying those situations are exactly the same? Yes, Your Honor, they are, because at this point, even though they have been disenfranchised pursuant to the 14th Amendment, they would now have their right to vote restored, but for these payments. And therefore, these payments are their only barrier to the ballot box at this time. And again, also, if we look at the way this court has determined taxes, it, we look at a functional approach, and the taxes here are functioning to directly support the government. Also, the one time this court has considered the 24th Amendment and Harmon v. Fresenius, it took an expansive approach to the 24th Amendment. In that case, even a certificate of residency, while not an explicit poll tax, was found unconstitutional because it served the same function as a poll tax. The amendment nullifies sophisticated as well as simple-minded modes of impairing the right guaranteed. And here, by placing these payments as an absolute barrier to the ballot box, it is effectively abridging the petitioner's right to vote in this case. Moreover, again, under this court's precedent in, in Harmon and in, in Harmon and as well in the healthcare decision, these payments are taxes rather than regulatory fees. This court has distinguished between payments that are going directly to the support of the government and payments that are merely serving a private interest. And this court stated in National Cable Television Association, the United States, that fees are incident to a voluntary act. They are akin to paying for a license to practice medicine or law, for example, whereas taxes serve a broader public purpose or public interest. Would you have a stronger case if one of your clients had been convicted of tax evasion under state law and the restitution order related to taxes? Well, no, Your Honor, because even you though- You wouldn't have a stronger case in that situation? Well, in that case, you could argue that they were actually disenfranchised because of a tax, but the fact is that the felony doesn't change what happened and they were disenfranchised because they committed a crime, regardless of whether a tax was involved in that case. But here, it's not the disenfranchisement that's relevant. It's the reenfranchisement. And the fact is that Tennessee has allowed a means to restore the right to vote to the petitioners in this case. Could the, could the state say, um, your right to vote is restored after the passage of five years? No, Your Honor, they could not because- they and that would probably be an equal protection problem, Your Honor. If there was no payment involved- No, for all, for all felons, for all felons. For all felons- My if, question is, could the state condition uh, reenfranchisement 
after a lapse of five years only from the end of probation, completion of sentence? Your Honor, again, that may be an equal protection problem, though it wouldn't be a 24th Amendment problem because there is no monetary burden imposed in that case. However, if it is found as a severe enough burden on voting, it could be an equal protection violation. So your, your, your argument under the 24th <clears throat> Amendment requires that there be some financial? Yes, Your Honor. There must be a financial burden to trigger the protections of the 24th Amendment. So how does that jibe with the um, certificate of, of residency? Well, Your Honor, in that case, the Harmon Court decided that the certificate served the same function as a poll tax. And they stated that the amendment nullifies... And, and why, why did we say it served the same function? It served the same function as a poll tax because it was effectively a barrier for people who wanted to vote in the next election. They either had to pay a poll tax or they had to fill a certificate of residency. But those people all had the right to vote, did they, didn't they? Your Honor, they did. And isn't that a huge distinction here that we have? I mean, in response to, to Judge Eagle's question, you said that it really, uh, it, it really is the same if you're disenfranchising people who have the right to vote versus re-enfranchising. It's, it's different, isn't it? Would you concede that it's different? Well, Your Honor, it's different insofar as they have been disenfranchised pursuant to Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. Which is but the Constitution. So the Constitution says you do not have the right to vote. So what's happening here is conferring, conferring a benefit. Well, Your Honor, states never have to re-enfranchise convicted felons. Exactly. However, Tennessee has chosen to do so. And once they chose to re-enfranchise convicted felons, that process must comply with the requirements of the Constitution. And that includes the protections of the 24th Amendment. Now, if the state, for example, were to say that 16-year-olds can now vote, 16-year-olds do not have a federal constitutional right to vote, but surely we cannot say only 16-year-olds who pay $5,000 can then vote. Under respondents' interpretation, as laid out in their brief, a state would be, I see that my time has elapsed. May I briefly conclude? Please do. Under respondents' interpretation, a state would be able to do so because 16-year-olds have no federal constitutional right to vote. However, that is clearly and unequivocally a 24th Amendment violation. Therefore, because these payments constitute petitioner's only barrier to the ballot box, I respectfully request that this court reverse the lower court's decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chief Justice Rendell, and may it please the court. My name is Oscar Schein, counsel for the respondents, various state officers of Tennessee. I will be addressing the equal protection challenge and my colleague Castile Scherter will be addressing the 24th Amendment claim. Tennessee is under no obligation to re-enfranchise felons once they've lost the right to vote. The state can re-disenfranchise felons permanently and entirely. Here, however, Tennessee has chosen to go beyond the requirements of the Constitution and offer felons a statutory path to re-enfranchisement. This case is about whether as a condition to that reenfranchisement, the state can effectuate certain legitimate public policy purposes before restoring the right to vote. First, by requiring felons to complete the entirety of their sentences and pay restitution to the victims of their crimes. And second, by forcing felons to be current on all child support payments, thus effectuating the state's interest in the welfare of children. But don't we have a problem here with um, really the status? I mean, you've got indigent status that is the, the target. Once the state decides to re-enfranchise, don't they have to do it on an even-handed basis? I mean, I found Z Zablocki and Bearden to be, to be very persuasive on that. What, what's wrong with that? Well, well Zablocki, of course, Your Honor, just to take those cases in order, indisputably dealt with a fundamental right. The petitioners in that case, there was no question that they had a fundamental right to marry. And so that was a case of the state infringing on a right that nobody questioned the existence of. Here, however, you're dealing with felons who are a constitutionally distinct class for equal protection purposes under this court's reasoning in Richardson versus Ramirez. There, Justice Rehnquist wrote that the legislative history and the text of Section 2 of the 14th Amendment affirmatively sanction the disenfranchisement of felons. And petitioners concede that the state need not ever restore that right to felons. So, But, but isn't it a matter of how you view what, what has been done by the amendment? In other words, you've got everyone's disenfranchised. And the question is, it, are the amendments just bringing it back 90%? Or has the amendment said, OK, we're going to say that once felons have completed their sentence, they are re-enfranchised? 
and the amendment says, but wait a minute, hold on a second. We're, we're gonna then gonna take that away. We've re-enfranchised everybody who served their sentence, but oops, sorry, if you've then, uh, you know, owed child support, or if you haven't paid all your restitution, then we're taking that away, and we, we have re-enfranchised, and then we're taking that away. Isn't that the same? as taking away that fundamental right? Respectfully, Madam Chief Justice, I, I'm not sure that I can agree with that characterization of how the statute operates. Nothing is being taken away from felons, and even petitioners concede that the state need not ever re-enfranchise felons. Once, the, they, once they do, the, isn't the, their problem? The actual text of the statute is that notwithstanding their completion of the other categories, notwithstanding the completion of their sentence and the end of their custodial incarceration, they are nonetheless not eligible to re-register because of their non-compliance with these two very specific kinds of court orders. So it's not the case that the state is restoring the right to vote, but then taking it away from a certain class of people. The How do you get around Griffin? So Griffin, of course, Your Honor. Illinois says, we don't have to give you a right to an appeal, but we can condition your exercise of that right on the basis of your ability to pay for trial transcripts and court records. And we very emphatically said that that doesn't fly. Uh, undoubtedly, Justice. What's David. the difference? The, the, in Griffin and in other cases like Bearden, the court was very clear well, that Griffin it was talking sort about. Griffin sort of stands alone. It, it, it really is the closest case. F fair enough, Your Honor. I, I think it's, it's distinguishable on a number of axes, the first of which being that the, in that case you're talking about a criminal appeal. And so the liberty interest involved there, the question in that case is really whether a person is going to jail or not. Maybe is about not. The, Maybe it's probationary sentence. You still had to pay for the transcript. You, even so, Your Honor, the, the, uh, the, this, as this case makes clear, the consequences of a criminal conviction are quite serious. And so people undoubtedly have a very important interest in that determination being right. There are liberty and other interests associated even with But it's not a fundamental a probate. right. You don't contend that Griffin involved a fundamental right to an, a criminal appeal. We do, Your Honor. We contend that in terms of but your- But we've said very clearly that there's no, there's no constitutional right whatsoever to an appeal. Every state could abolish their appellate courts, and that would be that would comport with the United States Constitution. I think, Justice Davis, that that case is usefully contrasted with cases where we've considered appeals for non-fundamental rights. Consider the court's decision in Ortwein, which dealt with adverse welfare benefits decisions. There, those petitioners had no right to welfare, no right to the monetary benefit from the state. And so they were not entitled to an appeal the same way that someone is entitled to appeal in a criminal conviction. And I think the distinction there has to do with the underlying interest, with the question of getting that criminal conviction right, which implicates basic liberty interests versus the welfare decision, which the state need not ever extend to citizens in the first place. Well, that Sim sounds like you're downplaying the right to vote. I mean, that's pretty important <laughs> in our country, <laughs> isn't it? So, uh, <laughs> Justice Davis, I, I, I'm sorry. I, di I did not mean that to sound flip. Nobody is questioning that, that voting is not like other rights. And we want to be sensitive to and respectful of the fact that petitioners here urgently want to vote in the next election. We would just offer that that interest in voting is not fundamental in the way that lawyers use that word for equal protection purposes. But it, it matters, certainly. I would only say that that, fun that interest in voting is not the only interest on the table. The state also has to consider the interests of these people's victims who are entitled to compensation through the restitution program and the interests of their children who are entitled to outstanding court orders to pay child support. To t take a step back there, what the whole point of that is just the state here is engaged in balancing. They have states making competing claims on them and they have to make distributional decisions about who is going to get what and when. And that kind of calculus is exactly what is insulated from judicial review by rational basis. If we were talking about a fundamental right or a suspect classification, undoubtedly we would be in the world of strict scrutiny. And if we were talking about ordinary citizens, Indeed, the right to vote for them would be fundamental, but the entire purpose of this court's holding in Richardson was that felons are a distinct class for equal protection purposes when it comes to voting. But, but what does uh, payment of child support have to do with, with voting? Uh, I mean, how can we you know, seem to equate or even deal with the two? And I think Judge Moore did a good job in her dissent saying, this really makes no sense. This has nothing to do with voting. Well, of, of course, it, it does not have anything to do with voting, Your Honor. That, that is absolutely correct. But I, I don't think it's true, as Justice Moore suggested, that it is not, 
completely unrelated from a felony conviction. You could imagine the state reasoning that in some sense, child support might really be an incidental cost of incarceration since someone has to take care of the felon's child while they are incarcerated. The state might conclude that the felon ought to be forced to compensate the non-incarcerated caregiver for any child care delivered while the felon was incarcerated. How would the statute apply to a felon who at the time she committed her offense, she was absolutely caught up on her child support obligation. And as a result of her incarceration, she fell behind. And then she's released, she completes her sentence, and she is indigent. Where's the rationality in that hypothetical to deny the franchise to such an individual? Un undoubtedly, Justice Davis, I, I do want to be sensitive to the fact that that person, I think You're we would all agree. Guy. Is <laughs> <laughs> we, appre we appreciate Thank that. you, Your Honor. <laughs> but where's the rationality? The, 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 the underlying concern there and the claim that petitioners are really making is that the law is over-inclusive with respect to the indigent, that these are people who, these, these are, there are people who refuse to pay, but then there are people like petitioners here who wish to pay but are unable to. And the claim is that that is over-inclusive with respect to the poor. Over-inclusive to the point of irrationality. That, and, that, and that is where the, we disagree with the petitioner's characterization, Your Honor. Where's the, the rationale? The, the state, for the purpose of the over, overarching statutory scheme, need not demonstrate a 100% collection rate. The state need only demonstrate that this makes it marginally more likely that some felons will comply with their outstanding court orders. So they are right in the sense that you can't get blood from a stone. The problem is that for rational basis purposes, you don't have to. You only need to get blood from those who are motivated to, do, to, to, to bleed essentially by the, I sort of regret that particular line of rhetoric, but the, the, the point ju is just that, the, it, that it, they, they only so need to demonstrate. So these petitioners of collateral damage to a larger statutory that, that would not be my preferred characterization of it, Your Honor, but it, the, tr the, re the reality is that rational basis is so deferential to the legislature that yes, it is always going to be possible to say that the law the line ought to have been drawn differently. That had we been in the Tennessee state legislature, we would not have voted for this because we think it unwise or unfair in some sort of extra legal sense. That's very different though than saying that the law is invalid under the Equal Protection Clause. That's an extraordinary claim because it involves overturning the decision of a democratically elected body. And to get that kind of extraordinary remedy, Your Honors, with respect to the petitioners, I would just say they have to show their work. They have to explain doctrinally why they're entitled to that kind of relief, and here they're unable to carry that burden. So are you basically conceding that if strict scrutiny applies, that burden is met in this case, and if one of these intermediate standards that is their fallback position before rational basis, that you can't meet that either? Basically, for you to win, you have to go to rational basis. Do, would you agree with that? No, Justice Eagles. Uh, to, to sort of move in order of descending seriousness of the standards of review, strict scrutiny is going to be a difficult burden for any statute to care. We're, we are zealous advocates, but we recognize that just by the nature of strict scrutiny, it would be a tougher case to make, certainly. We would still maintain that we're talking here about two very targeted types of court orders and that these are individually assessed against people. And so in that sense, it is tailored enough to meet strict scrutiny, but we recognize that many people will not be persuaded by that argument. Any standard of review short of strict scrutiny, though, Your Honor, I think we can definitely meet. The restitution payments are the easiest for us to make, since as Chief Justice Rendell mentioned earlier, that is in a real sense part of their sentence. It's something that is assessed to them as a result of their What family. about restitution to the state in a tax evasion case? Uh, I have to be careful with that hypothetical, Your Honor, just because you've inserted the word tax. And any yeah, time that that's involved... It's tax evasion. Uh, the state brings a prosecution. Defendant <clears throat> pleads guilty. Uh, there's $27,000 in unpaid taxes. And as a part of the sentence, the judge orders the defendant to make restitution, i.e. pay his taxes. 
that would not be per se unconstitutional. You could imagine, you can imagine how that might implicate 24th Amendment concerns just because the word tax is unambiguously in that statute, yeah. but it's not a per se equal protection problem because there the state's interest is the same. They are assessing a criminal sentence against an individual following a lawful conviction, and they are concluding rationally that the, before that person can be readmitted to the political community, they have to comply with the standards of those sentences. Aren't we just trying to prevent these people from from having a, uh, you know, the, the right to vote uh, because they haven't paid their child support. And shouldn't we really be testing the legitimacy of the government's interest here? How, how far can it go? If you have an unpaid traffic ticket, you can't, you can't be re-enfranchised. Um, you know, the way you put the, the, the your define rational basis, it's, it's really a pretty low bar. And I, I don't know that that's the right thing we should do. Certainly, Your Honor, I think, I think it's true that there is some outer limit of rational basis review where the state's interest seems so weak and attenuated and the means by which it achieves it seems so onerous that it begins to look arbitrary or irrational. I mean, child support. And, How many people coming out of prison are going, who are under a child support order will be current on their child support? It's totally punishing them because it's, it's an impossibility, is it not? It's really like saying anybody who's fathered a child out of wedlock and owes money uh, is not going to be able to vote, even though they've completed their sentence. I, I'm not sure that it's an impossibility, Your Honor. Indigence is not an immutable characteristic the way that, I mean, to, to compare just that being with. Just practical about people coming out of jail. Um, Bank robbery is one answer. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Bank robbery Bank is Bank robbery. one answer to indigency. <laughs> I mean, In fact, is, isn't, isn't that, doesn't that demonstrate the irrationality of, of this scheme? That you've got a felon who apparently desperately wants to vote, and in effect, the state's saying to him or her, you got to commit another crime, sell crack, <laughs> rob a bank, <laughs> pay your child support, and then you can vote. It, it strikes me as just utterly absurd. R respectfully, Justice Davis, that sounds to me... Uh, and I, I do mean this respectfully, that sounds to be like a policy, qu that questioning the Tennessee legislature's reasoning on policy grounds. Well, that's what that we have to do, we, to, to test means uh, and under, ends. Under, un, under rational basis, Your Honor, as this court explained the standard, at least in cases like FCC versus Beach Communications, the state need only demonstrate a plausible policy rationale for its, its reason. So the fact that we might think it unwise, even misguided, even silly, is not enough to invalidate the law under rational basis for equal protection purposes. But if in this type of situation, we can say, and we find it more, more punitive than legitimate, if you will, uh, and, uh, you know, as we have in other cases, found that there's really a, an animus here or a motive, um, and, and is adding extra punishment, basically. It's almost like the, you know, when you add uh, the fine, uh, the case where the fine was going to add time to someone's sentence. Well, that's a liberty interest. Well, here we have that additional penalty relating to a voting interest. Oh, haven't we seen that in cases, and why couldn't we do that here? Say that's really just slapping, flapping this guy while he's down, basically. Well, as, as, a, as a threshold him, matter, Madam Chief Justice, it, 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 it is not enhancing anyone's sentence. In a real sense, the petitioners here are already starting from zero. The, the relevant baseline comparison is what the state could otherwise do, which is never re-enfranchise anyone for any reason. So it's not like the case of Bearden, where you are punishing someone additionally for their failure to pay a fine. But the, the larger point is well taken, and you're absolutely right that if there were evidence in the record that the only motivation for the state in this case was just to punish poor people, that might be a serious problem along the lines of a cause of action like Romer or, or Moreno. But there's nothing in the record to suggest that that's what's actually going on. Could we be sure there wouldn't be floor statements in the Tennessee legislature if we send this back and afford the plaintiffs, the petitioners, an opportunity for discovery? We don't, we don't know what the state's motivation is. Well, you're there's, on, no, there's no fact. There's been no discovery in this case. And we can't imagine why they picked child support as compared to any, anything else. Yeah. I, mean, I, I might have been unclear about the connection of the child support. I, I think there is a, a sense in which it could be related to the felony conviction for at least some plaintiffs. That might strike you as over-inclusive or attenuated, but I'm not sure that's enough to invalidate a law under rational basis. Um, I the question of, of remand and whether there might be additional fact-finding, this is a 12C, which is functionally treated like a 12B6. There's just no set of facts under which these particular conditions would rise to the kind of directed animus that you saw in cases like Romer. I think a useful exercise would be to imagine... How, how do we know that without 
an evidentiary record. I, I just, I'm not clear on how we know that, the, the, how we can take that as a given. The, the plaintiffs, of course, Your Honor, had the opportunity to make arguments of that kind but at trial. They it was never had raised. Discovery. It was never raised. The, even the allegation, Your Honor, was not even raised at trial or at the appellate level. The claim has always been that these are unconstitutional per se because they operate as wealth qualifications, not because they're directed at a particular class. And I think just intuitively, if the real purpose here was just to go after poor people, this, these would be. Sorry, I've run out of time. May I briefly conclude? Yes, if, if the real purpose was just to go after poor people, I think you could imagine much better conditions for that. If the law said, for example, that there's an employment qualification or if you're on welfare, you can't return the right to vote, that would seem like a much better cause of action for them. But that's not the case that they have here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Castile Sugar, counsel for respondent, and I will be addressing the 24th Amendment claim. Tennessee's reenfranchisement statute does not violate the 24th Amendment because as a threshold issue, the amendment is inapplicable to this case. The 24th Amendment protects voters. Petitioners lost the right to vote when they were convicted of a felony. However, even if the amendment applies, Tennessee's statute is still constitutional because the payments of restitution and child support do not constitute a tax as intended under the 24th Amendment. To begin with the threshold issue, there is a critical distinction between a right guaranteed by the Constitution and the restoration of that right. Tennessee could constitutionally disenfranchise felons indefinitely. However, they have chosen to go above and beyond their constitutional obligation and provide a restoration process for felons. This restoration process is not governed by the 24th Amendment. So you think then they could say you have to pay a poll tax if you're a convicted felon and want to vote again? Your Honor, that would not be unconstitutional under the 24th Amendment. However, that's not to say that it would not, be, it would not have other constitutional protections. Like what? The Equal Protection Clause, for example, Your Honor. Why would it be an Equal Protection violation? If there, was an, if there was no rational basis for an explicit poll tax, then that could potentially be raise, an equal... Raise revenue for the, for the, for the government. There's always, a, there's always a rational basis for a tax. <laughs> <laughs> Respectfully, Your Honor. <laughs> Respectful, Respectfully, Your Honor, that would, be, um, that would have to require the state to bring forward a legitimate state interest, with, which in your hypothetical, um, there may be a, a rational basis behind that. However, um, that would be an equal protection issue. As far as the 24th Amendment issue, a cause of action under the 24th Amendment re requires two necessary conditions. First, it requires a constitutional right, and second, it requires the payment of an explicit tax. Under, um, I'll, although I acknowledge that it would be a harder constitutional question in the case of an explicit poll tax, as that was what the 24th Amendment was specified to prohibit, it would still not be a 24th violation because felons, for example, do not have a constitutional right to vote. Well, the amendment says other taxes. Yes, Your Honor. The, you, to, you're not reading that out of the amendment, of course. Absolutely not, Your Honor. The, the 24th Amendment was, was enacted to prohibit um, a, the poll tax. Uh, when Congress decided to include the language of other tax in the amendment, there's no evidence that it intended to expand the scope of the amendment to include personal debts such as restitution and child support payments. Uh, if you look to the congressional hearings, they gave examples of what should constitute an other tax as things that are considered most common and formally as a tax, such as a real estate tax or a personal property tax. But, but the whole thrust of the 24th Amendment is that we shall not erect financial barriers to voting. Is that not, not correct? Respectfully, Your Honor, I think that's too broad of an interpretation of the 24th Amendment. The 24th Amendment, as petitioners noted in their brief, is an absolute prohibition and therefore should be narrowly construed and has been by both this court and other courts. The, the language of tax is important um, in this context because there are other constitutional protections on the right to vote that other financial barriers um, would be considered under. However, um, to consider any financial barrier or 24th Amendment issue would be a novel and expansive reading of the amendment. There will always be minor economic impediments to the right to vote. Consider, for example, transportation costs to get to and from the ballot box or paying... On that score, imagine the state set up a polling place in a private building that required automobile access 
where there was a fee to pull in and park your car while you go vote. Would that violate the 24th Amendment? For the, requ all the requirement that you come in in a vehicle and that you park the vehicle and that you pay to park the vehicle in order to go inside and vote. If you're speaking about the 24th Amendment generally as it generally applies to all citizens, Your Honor, that would be a harder constitutional question because that would take the form of a poll tax, that it would be a fixed why, tax. Why would it take the form? It's being paid to a private landowner. Your it's, Honor, it's a private garage or a private parking facility surrounding this building where the state has placed a polling place. Certainly, Your Honor. The, the paradigmatic poll tax is a fixed tax levied on each individual within a jurisdiction. So if the only place that you were allowed, that you had access to the ballot box was this private place and every individual had to pay a fixed fee, that would take the form of a poll tax and therefore would violate the 24th Amendment on ordinary Even citizens. Even if it was paid to a private property owner? Arguably, yes, Your Honor, because it would take the form of a poll tax. Um, why, isn't, why isn't what's going on here the form of a poll tax? Your Honor, the, the payments of restitution and child support are not analogous to a poll tax in either form or purpose. They are not fixed amounts levied on each individual without, within a jurisdiction. Um, they vary and are not um, applied to every person within a jurisdiction. They are also not similar to a poll tax in its purpose. The 24th, or the, a poll tax was a targeted discrimination um, and was meant to suppress the minority votes. Well, why isn't this a targeted discrimination? We've got the indigent, the status of being indigent as being as targeted here. A and I don't know why that's not a good thing. I think, I think it's not a good thing to have uh, financial wherewithal be your, your ticket to voting. Your Honor, the, the, any effect that this might have on indigents is more of an unintended consequence. Um, earlier, you discussed the fact that this is a, this is a statute um, incentivizing the payments of these personal debts. It's dissimilar to a poll tax in that it's not targeted to suppress the minority vote. It's targeted to incentivize these personal debts being paid to the victims well, but, of the crime. But is it really? Is that really what's happening? And because people, you know, if they if they are indigent and they want to vote that they're suddenly, again, going to rob a bank or do something so that they can pay their restitution. How are they going to just instantly be able to do this and say, oh, yeah, I, uh, I want to vote, so I am going to find that money. Just, you know, it's under the mattress. I'm just going to get it. I'm really not indigent. I mean, if they're indigent, you know, you've already said they're not going to be able to do that. How can you incentivize something that's in basically an impossibility? Your Honor, I hear your concern, although I do believe that's an equal protection issue and not a 24th Amendment issue. The, the, the importance of this case is whether or not these payments constitute a tax. Um, restitution and child support should not be considered a, a poll tax because they're not similar and they should not be considered an other tax as well. What if the restitution, uh, the, the child support, in, in many areas of this country, particularly urban areas such as Memphis uh, or Chattanooga, <coughs> uh, Child support is actually paid to the state because the child and the custodial parent are receiving state benefits in the form of uh, aid to families with dependent children. And in those circumstances, the child support obligor, uh, typically a man, but not infrequently a woman, actually is paying the state in a, as a form of reimbursement for the benefits being provided to the custodial parent and the, and the child. If, if the plaintiffs, if the petitioners could show that one of their clients fell into that category, would you have a more difficult case? Because now you have the state clearly getting revenue in the form of a tax exaction. Your Honor, that would arguably be a more difficult case um, however, it would still, it should not still be considered a tax under the 24th Amendment for several purposes, f for several reasons. First, that would still go to a very narrow and specified purpose. The common and ordinary understanding of a tax is that it's used for a general purpose. So although the government may, pay, may play an administrative necessity sort of role in that statutory scheme, it should not be considered a tax for 24th Amendment purposes. How about your uh, opponent's argument that the uh, Affordable Care Act, the, interpret the interpretation we've given uh, as a tax, um, you know, is fairly broad? That was you, Ms. Chief Justice. 
<laughs> I've, so, I've changed gender. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. Certainly, Your Honor. This. This court has taken a functional look at a tax. However, even under a functional analysis, the payments of restitution and child support should not be considered a tax for 24th Amendment purposes. Several of the elements that Why? this court Why? considered. Why? It's a functional approach? Functional? It works. You can't just say that and have it be so. Why not? Certainly, Your Honor. So there are several elements that this court looked at in the Affordable Care Act, one of which was whether or not the payments were collected by a taxing agency. The individual mandate was collect collected by the IRS. Um, different in this case is that the payment of restitution is collected through the sentencing courts and the payments of child support are collected through Tennessee's Department of Human Services. In the individual, or in the health care decision, this court pointed... But that's government. That's, that's not third party. That's, that's government collecting it. So why doesn't that work? Certainly, Your Honor. A, a taxing agency, to be more specific than a government agency. In the health care decision, this court pointed back to its decision in Drexel Furniture, where the court held that the, ch the child labor tax, even though explicitly called a tax, was in actuality not a tax because it was collected by the Department of Labor, a government agency, but not a taxing agency. So this similarly should be seen as evidence in this case that because uh, the Tennessee Department of Revenue is not collecting either one of these payments, they should not be considered a tax. Well, the Sixth Circuit, where Tennessee is, right, yes. has, has said to the contrary on that, though, in what, <clears throat> Wright versus McLean, that was the Tennessee law about parolees making payments to some victim compensation fund. They found that to be um, a tax, right? Yes, Your Honor. However, restitution should not be considered a tax for 24th Amendment purposes because, as Chief Justice Rendell pointed out earlier, it is simply part of an individual's sentence. Therefore, these individuals even don't even have the right to vote back because they have not fully completed their sentence. Also, restitution only circumstantially could potentially go to a government agency. More likely than not, in the vast majority of cases, as Chief Justice Rendell pointed out, it goes to a third party, not to the state. To consider what if Tennessee uh, enacted a law that said henceforth all of the uh, restitution payments and child support shall go through the Tennessee Taxing Authority? Wouldn't that therefore, just by virtue of doing that, then they've satisfied that it's a tax, correct? Your Honor, that would be a much harder question because it would go through the taxing agency. However, the agency is, is not dispositive of whether or not something should be considered a tax. It's merely evidence. You Except still have to look... in the look affordable care, I mean, the functional, the functional equivalent, uh, the only, the real hang-up there was the taxing, it was the taxing authority, so that was permissible. Why wouldn't the same thing apply here, looking at it from a functional standpoint? Certainly, Your Honor. The, in the Affordable Care Act, they also considered that the individual mandate was expected to raise $4 billion worth of revenue. It was something that when you looked at the elements of the individual mandate, the ordinary person would consider that to be a tax. Restitution and child support are very dissimilar from the individual mandate. Um, it is not, it, neither one of these payments are collected in order to raise revenue. There may be an attenuated sort of circumstance that revenue may be raised from these. However, that should not transform an otherwise constitutional statute into an unconstitutional poll tax for 24th Amendment purposes. The 24th Amendment has always been narrowly construed, and for good reason, because it is an absolute prohibition. Therefore, the payments of restitution and child support should not be considered a tax under the 24th Amendment. For all these reasons, the respondents respectfully request that this court affirm the lower court's decision. Thank you. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, Counselor. Rebuttal? May it please the court, I'd like to briefly respond to two points opposing counsel makes. First, to begin with the 24th Amendment claim, respondent's theory regarding the 24th Amendment would allow states to erect explicit poll taxes on the franchise, which not only violates the explicit text of the Constitution, but also clearly contravenes the purpose that the 24th Amendment was enacted, which was to broadly provide access to the franchise and to prevent the disenfranchisement of the poor. Respondents' interpretation of the 24th Amendment would effectively create a parallel system of voting eligibility based entirely upon wealth. We cannot relegate these issues to equal protection analysis alone. Justice Davis, as you pointed out, states always have a rational basis to collect a tax, and certainly we can imagine situations in which states could collect fees for reenfranchisement, and the 24th Amendment would not be able to address these claims. 
Here, the petitioner's right to vote is impaired solely by reason of failure to pay the tax, and the statute violates the 24th Amendment. But if we start from the proposition that they have been disenfranchised, then the 24th Amendment doesn't really even apply to them, does it? Well, Your Honor, it does apply insofar as Tennessee has provided a mechanism to reinstate the right to vote. And again, that triggers the protections of the 24th Amendment. Moreover, respectfully, the respondents are ignoring the nature of the interest involved in this case. This is voting, a right that this court has traditionally been protective of because it is preservative of all other civil and political rights. And the importance of the right to vote, coupled with the discriminatory impact of this statute upon the indigent in this case, warrants a heightened form of review for equal protection analysis. This court has recognized that no right is more precious in a free country than that of having a voice in elections. And other rights, even the most basic, are illusory if the right to vote is undermined. Therefore, because these payments constitute petitioners only barrier to the ballot box, I respectfully request that this court reverse the lower court's decision. Thank you. All right, counsel. The case was well argued. We'll take it under advisement and uh, we will Ask the clerk to recess court. We will go and conference. All rise. Thank you all for your attention so far. The judges will return as soon as they reach a verdict. Well, you all were spectacular. We uh, had a very difficult, nearly impossible time um, trying to decide what we're supposed to decide, and I guess that's best team and best oralist, because we'd like to say all four of you were, were all of those things. It was just amazing. Um, We'll give you a few little comments and then announce our decision, Justice Eagles. Yes, I certainly agree. Y'all were fabulous. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to listen to you. You were each so prepared and um, so uh, on top of this case. It was very, very impressive. I uh, liked how you didn't get flustered. Um, the petitioners did a really good job of focusing on that key interest of voting and kept coming back to that. They did a nice job bringing that in uh, to the argument in a number of different ways. Uh, that was your strong point, and you, you hit, hit, hit on it uh, in a good way. I thought uh, the respondents were, did a really good job of answering the questions directly uh, not shying away from the issues and also in both of you referred to previous questions or comments made by one of us and you did a particularly nice job of uh, bringing that back into play as you were answering later questions. So I particularly appreciated those things, but y'all were all extremely good. Uh, I have very little to add to that. You all were fabulous. Uh, I've done a lot of moot courts all over the country, and I've done a lot of real arguments, both appellate and as a trial judge for 22 years, and you all are just phenomenal. Um, I, I really like the way all of you listen to the question. 
um, we hear the term active listening in various contexts. And I actually made a note to myself about each and every one of you, active listeners, and your responses to what I thought was were some fairly challenging questions. I'm sure you've heard them all before <laughs> as you've prepared. Um, but if you haven't, you certainly appear to have heard it before. Uh, you listen to the questions, you were engaged with the bench, uh, you really, really lived up to the gold standard uh, of appellate advocacy, and that is having a conversation with the bench to explain why you should win this case. Uh, I thought the petitioners uh, really, uh, on the, you know, in every moot court, there's always some little procedural issue that arises one way or the other. And I thought you, you folks were really ready for the, the whole issue of do you want to remand. I was a little surprised you were willing to say we should have judgment in our favor, but you sort of backed off of that a little bit and said, no, we'll, we'll take a remand. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that, that's all we'll get. And I thought that the, the respondents, your responses to questions were really extraordinary. I, I thought you got some tough questions. Uh, I hope they were tough. We, we tried to make them tough. And you, you were absolutely ready for everything, and you gave us your best shot. You didn't concede anything. You didn't run away from anything. And that's exactly what, what, the, court, what the court is looking for. I should mention, by the way, in this context, you know, um, we have a number of appellate clinics around the circuit, and certainly Duke's is among the best, is, is one of the best, no question about it. And a couple of years ago, I don't know how many of you have heard this story. It's a true story. A couple of years ago, in Richmond, uh, one of the uh, students arguing a case uh, as a part of the appellate clinic fainted at oral argument. Have you all heard that? Yeah, some of you have heard that. Uh, apparently had, had missed breakfast and was, of course, very stressed out. Um, and I don't remember his name. He will live in, in fame, uh, I'm sure, here and in the Fourth Circuit. But he immediately got up and went right at it, and he won the case. <laughs> Not that you should think that that's a, me a mechanism for winning your case, but, but, but what I saw here tonight obviously uh, tells me, reconfirms to me uh, what an incredible job uh, the opportunities you get here at Duke to develop your skills. And so it was a genuine pleasure for me to spend these uh, 60 minutes with you guys. Agreed. I don't have that much to add from a substance standpoint, but... Um, having sat on the Court of Appeals for 15 years, um, you're among the, the best that I've seen. Um, echoing what my fellow justices have said, your, your ability to not get flustered, uh, to take the questions head on and respond to them, uh, and to respond on point. Uh, sometimes in argument you can tell that the lawyer is deer in the headlights and you know, is not quite sure where, where it's going or where he or she's going, and we, didn't, we really didn't get any of that. We got real good, solid answers. Uh, I think we were tough. I, I know I, I wore myself out uh, <laughs> asking the initial questions, um, but the, uh, your conversational tone, your ability to react uh, nicely to some of the questions that might have been, and I, I think in a couple situations, maybe more with petitioners and respondents, we were asking the, 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 the one question to the, to the tax person. We were asking, and, and you didn't get flustered. You, you addressed it and said, okay, well, you, you know, obviously you've all argued all sides, so you probably can get up in the, in the middle of the night and <laughs> expound on both the tax aspect and the other aspect, but it was clear you, you had that facility, and instead of saying to us, well, that's, that's my friend's argument, so you should have <laughs> asked that question to, to him or to her, you acted like, okay, that's fair game, I'll, I'll field the question on the, you know, with the nature of the interest, even though I'm the tax person. Um, but again, your conversational tone, your you know, eye contact, and style, style matters, <coughs> and you all four were just really engaging, and you engaged us, and you were interested, and we were interested in what you were saying. Um, and, and that's real, it really is important. Um, everybody, uh, just nobody had any things that were distracting to us, you, and, and that's important. 
Uh, and I think, Oscar, you had uh, kind of more of a, a dramatic flair when you were answering <laughs> <your> questions. <laughs> but, it, but it was good. You were kind of mixing it up uh, and responding uh, appropriately. And a little bit of humor is, is not a bad thing. Do I, do I look like the Chief Justice? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it was uh, tough. But we went downstairs to confer and just kind of looked at each other because it's very, very, very difficult to say that any of you were better than the others were, that one team was was the other, because it was just so, so top rate on, on both sides. So, And you know, we always say that. You always say that. Yeah. But I, we really, <laughs> <laughs> we really, we really you do. do not put us in Yes, it is just it's not so nice. It's so true. It's so, so true. So whoever is, or the winners or, you know, the others are not the losers, because you were all just. They're all winners. Yeah, so put that. Is there a trophy? Can we put a footnote? <laughs> you know, really, really, others were really, really good. Um, okay, uh, the uh, best oralist. Um, we have decided that Shafali Baliga, the best oralist. Uh, and we have decided the best team. Uh, was the petitioners. And, you know, sometimes it happens, and I don't know if you've seen this through doing this over and over again, but sometimes when somebody has the argument that may seem, the, you know, the, the most difficult to persuade, uh, and I think I at least, when I picked up petitioners, um, I read the brief and I thought they they really made the best of a bad situation. <laughs> you know, it was it was going to be a tough argument. And I think sometime when you have that and when you're arguing that, you you know maybe you dig a little deeper to to try to convince. Uh, uh, and you know that was that's kind of our after the fact rationale for how the heck do you decide? Uh, but we didn't decide on that basis. But sometimes maybe you you can't help yourself but think as you're listening that. Oh, that, that's a good answer because it's really an impossible question. Um, so, you know, maybe that played into it, but maybe it didn't. But you were all just absolutely fantastic. And uh, you know, we thought we'd lose our dinner if we said everybody wins. <laughs> <laughs> the dean wanted us to, and the, and the, and the moot court, court board court wanted us to choose a winner. So so we, so had, we, had, we had to. We had to. The devil made us do it. We so. had to. But thank you all. Um, what, what, what's the the uh, order of business now? Well, the order of business is uh, first to thank our panel. I believe we owe them a great deal of gratitude. <laughs> but with that taken care of, congratulations to all of our participants and, and the winners. This concludes the 51st annual Dean's Cup, and we invite you all to join us in a small reception out in Star Commons. Thank you so much. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.